Father, I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today is Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate the promised Holy Spirit described in Acts 2 and John 14 and 16. And we pray for that same Holy Spirit to continue his work in and through uh, us individually and in and through us uh, here as St. Thomas Anglican Church. Um, Don read Acts 2 verses 1 through 11 for us uh, about when the Holy Spirit came upon the gathered early church. Um, I want to go one verse further. Verse 12 says, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? Uh, That's the question for this morning. What does Pentecost mean? What does it mean then? What does it mean now? What does it mean for you and for me? You might remember that in Acts chapter 1, Jesus told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Those were the last words that Jesus shared with his closest friends before ascending to the Father. And so at Pentecost, God's Holy Spirit was poured out just as he promised. The person and power of God himself, God the Holy Spirit, came to indwell and empower the church for her mission and for her witness. And that's not just a back then thing. That's true today as well. The Holy Spirit comes to empower and indwell us for mission and ministry. Today on Pentecost is an ideal day to wait again on the Holy Spirit, to ask the Spirit to fill us anew, to empower us anew for mission and ministry, to lead and guide us as his church and as his followers. Uh, We'll mainly look at Acts chapter 2 this morning, but there are several other passages just to give us a baseline of who is the Holy Spirit. St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings uh, too deep for words. A little bit earlier in John chapter 14, Jesus in the Upper Room Discourse, um, this is what Deacon Text read for us, said the Father will send us and give us another helper. Literally the word paraclete um, in Greek, and as Bishop Frank pointed out last week, Um, When you think of helper, uh, don't just think of the Holy Spirit as a warm, cozy blanket, just to kind of help us and keep us warm. Um, This isn't a virtual, supernatural assistant like Siri on your Apple device to lend assistance um, to our agendas or our tasks. Uh, There is much more to the Holy Spirit. When we are feeling uh, weak and inadequate, when we don't have words to speak, or words to pray, when we are in desperate need of peace that passes understanding, the Holy Spirit is our helper, our advocate, our guide, and our friend. Um, According to the Catechism of the ACNA, have you ever seen this book? Some of you guys have seen this. It says, To Be a Christian in Anglican Catechism. It helps us just to get a baseline for things. Um, Here's who we're told the Holy Spirit is. God the Holy Spirit is the third person in the one being of the Holy Trinity, co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son, and equally worthy of our honor and our worship. Uh, We're later told here that what happens, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the Holy Spirit uh, imparts life to every living thing in creation, reveals God's word to his people and call sinners to a new life of faith in the saving and life-giving work of Jesus. The Holy Spirit unites Christians to Jesus, indwelling them, convicting them of sin, giving them spiritual gifts, and bearing spiritual fruit in their lives. And so today on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to focus on two main things. At first, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us, And secondly, the ministry of the Holy Spirit through us. So first, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. Um, And as we talk about the Holy Spirit, 
Um, I, I've uh, been really influenced by a pastor in London named Nicky Gumbel. Uh, Nicky Gumbel was the lead pastor of Holy Trinity Brompton in London. Um, he pioneered the Alpha Course, which is a worldwide uh, introduction to the Christian faith. And he points out that for a long time, at least recently in the church, uh, the Holy Spirit was pretty much ignored. Uh, many in the church focus on the Father and on the Son, but weren't so sure about the Holy Spirit. Uh, his playful hypothesis is that that's just something lost in translation. That because the older versions of the scriptures uh, named the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost, folks were just freaked out. I mean, think about it. A ghost? That sounds creepy. That sounds eerie. That, that sounds like uh, supernatural evil. Not something that is supernaturally good. And of course, God is supernatural good. The Holy Spirit is supernatural good, and we need uh, the supernatural. And so I get it. The Holy Spirit um, can seem weird. Uh, people who are really excited about the Holy Spirit um, are often interesting, to say the least. Um, many of us have probably encountered really weird things that folks say are from the Holy Spirit in prayer or in worship or from a friend. And I would say if you've seen things misused, well, the antidote for that is right use not setting it aside. We need to rightly engage the Holy Spirit and the ministry and person of the Holy Spirit. And, and yeah, sometimes weird things are going to happen. When the Holy Spirit shows up, um, it can be a little out of control, like we read about in Acts chapter 2. I mean, if you look at the day of Pentecost, I mean, did you hear all that's going on? It's like a fireworks show and a sonic boom and a bomb all go off at once. It's wild. Everyone starts speaking in tongues. People are blown away. What is happening? Well, here's the main thing. Um, if you read throughout the Old Testament, um, we see the Holy Spirit active, and the Holy Spirit will come upon particular people at particular times for particular tasks. And they'll do those tasks as uh, commissioned by the Lord. And then it seems like, okay, the Holy Spirit moves on. Whereas on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all people everywhere to remain with us. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 2. We're being told that now the Holy Spirit is for everybody. It's to come to empower everyone for ministry and for mission and here's the thing, when I think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us, um, listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. He says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit to us is the way we experience and receive the love of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit um, within the church, the ministry of the Spirit um, to us. And I'll just point out one thing to know is that Pentecost as a celebration, um, as a feast, is not just a New Testament thing. Um, the, the day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost, occurred throughout the Old Testament um, as the Feast of Weeks. And at that time, it was a harvest festival. They would celebrate the spring harvest that was brought in. They would bring their first fruits unto the Lord, and they would celebrate. Um, it was also, um, and this is very interesting to think about what the Lord is doing by sending the Holy Spirit on this particular day. This was also the day that Israel remembered uh, when God gave the law on Mount Sinai. That was all done together on Pentecost. So Bishop N.T. Wright points out, he kind of connects these. When the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, what did Moses do? He went up on the mountain, and then he came down again with the law. Here, Jesus has gone up, not to a mountain, but gone up to be with the Lord in the ascension. And so now the Spirit comes down. And Luke wants us to understand that he is coming down again, not with a written law carved on tablets of stone, but the dynamic energy of the law designed to be written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
And what's going on with the fire? That's weird, right? Um, uh, in the Old Testament, if you think about the image of fire, that usually signifies God's presence. Smoke or fire, if you see those, you go, the Lord is here. Um, the Lord is present. And so here we're, we're to see that the Holy Spirit comes to know that God is present with his church. That this is, uh, the church is the new temple of God, filled with the fiery glory of the Holy Spirit. And in almost every way, each and every Christian is now a sign and a wonder. Set aflame with the Holy Spirit to bear witness to God himself. Now, whenever God appeared as fire in the Old Testament, people were terrified, weren't they? And rightly so, fire is dangerous. The presence of God, we want to have a right reverence for the Lord and his holiness. Sometimes in the Old Testament, when God's presence was there, people were even destroyed because of his holiness. Um, but this is different. There, there's a miracle in the Old Testament, and, and Tim Keller pointed this out years ago. I found it so helpful. He said, when, when Moses is called into God's service, it's from a burning bush. There's a bush, and it's on fire. And the miracle is not that there's a, a bush on fire. The miracle is that there's a bush on fire that's not being destroyed or consumed. It's just blazing with the glory of God. So in the same way, if we think about the Holy Spirit coming as fire upon each one of us, upon the church, it's like that burning bush where the fire comes, but we're not consumed or destroyed. It becomes a beacon for the Lord, a sign and wonder of his presence with us that we are bearing the fiery glory of the Lord being strengthened unto life by the loving fire of God. And what's worth kind of just noticing in Acts 2 is that Jesus has given instructions to his apostles. Um, in Acts 1, they've even gone through um, a, a prayerful ritual to replace Judas so that they have the right number, 12 apostles. And so you wait, okay, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon the 12 apostles, right? Well, yes, but also on everyone gathered. Don't miss that. The Holy Spirit comes upon everyone gathered. Yes, the 12 apostles, but everybody. And that's key because when the Holy Spirit comes, it's not just uh, for super Christians. It's for all of God's people. We're to have access to the Holy Spirit. We're to receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. And we're also given the wonderful privilege of seeing the ministry of the Holy Spirit through us. I mean, right away here, the early church, um, I think many of us get, get fixated on the fact that they're speaking in tongues. But then if you notice, all these people, they understand it. And they say, we hear them declaring the works of God. They begin speaking the language of mission, bearing witness to the Lord. And that's the normal occurrence. The regular function of the Holy Spirit is to empower Christians to bear witness to the gospel while assuring us of our connection to God through the experience of his presence. That's what we hope will happen when we invite the Holy Spirit to come. And then on Pentecost, what happens? Well, Peter gets up to preach, and we all get really scared. Because when Peter opens his mouth, we're used to the wrong thing coming out or a foot going in. But instead, we have this incredible sermon where Peter has now been filled with the Holy Spirit and is being empowered to declare the works of God in remarkable ways. And we have uh, the rest of Acts chapter 2 is mainly his, his sermon. Um, and it makes it clear in his sermon that God is now fulfilling all of his promises and that the power of God is now at work in new and fresh ways. He uses this language of signs and wonders but, but not in a, in a miracle way or a, a, you know, a magic way. He connects signs and wonders to the gospel, to the actual death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And he tells them that Jesus of Nazareth is the one through whom all these things are happening. He announces the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. He bears witness to all that God has done in Christ. It's not just um, a crazy feeling in his stomach, 
It's not just a trick. It's not just for show. It's to actually connect them to the gospel story, to know the one who has died and has rose again and who sends the Holy Spirit into their midst. For Peter, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is proof and vindication of who the Lord Jesus is and what he did. And it's just one more confirmation that Jesus said, I will ascend and I will send to you the Holy Spirit. He goes, look, he did that too, just like he promised. And we are now in the age of the Spirit. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And in response to the sermon, um, the whole gathered people, and there's a lot of folks there, says that they are cut to the heart. And they ask, what shall we do? Um, I love that. I'm actually a little jealous of that. I'm always like, man, if I just preach the sermon, and folks are like, what shall we do? Like there's an actual follow-up dialogue, not just, oh, that's nice. Let's do the creed now. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> and what's he tell them? Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. The Holy Spirit is a gift available for you and me to receive. And it's not just a gift we receive one time. But we can ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us anew again and again and again. Over and over again in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is called a gift. And as we think about the link between the Holy Spirit's ministry to us and the Spirit's ministry through us, we can think about the idea of gifts. The Holy Spirit is a gift, and he pours out spiritual gifts to you and to me to use for mission and ministry. We, we read the passage from 1 Corinthians, um, those are all the fun gifts, right? That's all the wild stuff, prophecy and healing and tongues. Um, I kind of like, there's another list of gifts in the book of Romans, um, and it's awesome. It's like, hey, who has the gift of administration? <coughs> who has the gift of generosity? Let's give unto the Lord. It's all those kinds of gifts. And what I love is that all of that is needed for the church, those very practical things that the Lord does to take care of his church and those wild, extraordinary things that the Lord does to take care of his church and bear witness until the gospel. All of these are gifts given to make us who we're called to be in the Lord so that the Holy Spirit can minister in and through us. Uh, last week, we had a whole line of people up here and we, we baptized a bunch of folks and we prayed for the Holy Spirit to begin uh, his work in them, uh, planting a seed that we pray by God's grace will be nurtured and grow and flourish into mature faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, folks came before the bishop and were confirmed, and the bishop prayed for the Holy Spirit to be stirred up in their lives uh, for mission and ministry. And we had a whole group of folks who joined St. Thomas. And every time we have a group of folks join, I'm so interested to go, what gift do they have that we need that they can now bring and express so the Holy Spirit is ministering to us and through us as a congregation? Because each one of us has a gift that's come from the Holy Spirit. And some of those line up with some of our natural inclinations and experiences, and sometimes we get things that we never thought we would receive. And it's now a gift to be used uh, for the building up of the body and the mission of God. Now, when I think about the gifts that the Lord gives, um, there's a scene actually in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that I always think of. Have you guys read that? Or you've at least like watched the movie? All right. Well, one of the best parts about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, is you have the appearance of Father Christmas. And Father Christmas comes on the scene and I always say he functions much like John the Baptist. He, he's this forerunner letting us know what's coming, uh, making room for the lion, Aslan, the, the, the Christ figure who will come. Um, but there's this scene where Father Christmas appears, and you've got the beaver family, and you've got three of the four children, because one of the four children is doing what? Betraying them. 
You've got three of the four children gathered, and Father Christmas is there. And he tells them the magic of the witch is weakening. Aslan is on the move. And then he gives gifts to each of the children. Uh, first of all, I just imagine when the Holy Spirit comes to just imagine, man, the magic of this world and its brokenness is weakening. The Lord is on the move. And then he gives gifts. Here's what he gives. Uh, Peter gets this magnificent shield and sword. And he receives it solemnly with his back straight, feeling very grown up and mature. Susan gets a bow and a quiver of arrows and a horn that she can use and blow in time of need. And little Lucy gets this little glass bottle filled um, with a cordial from the juice of fire flowers. And we're told that just a little drop of that can bring healing to anyone. Uh, and she also gets a little dagger because it's, it's Lucy and it's cute for her to get a little dagger. Um, but as Father Christmas gives them these gifts, here's what he tells them. These are your presents. And they are tools, not toys. And when I think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, each one of us has been given a gift by the Spirit. And these are tools. They're not toys. They're to be used for the building up of the body and the advancing of the mission and ministry of the Lord. And so it's worth pondering today, what have you been given? What have you received from the Lord? Where are you being called to put that into practice, this tool, not a toy? All right. Uh, some of you know this has been a big weekend for our family. I'm a little bleary-eyed still. Um, we talk about May as one day at a time May. <laughs> Just we're going to get through it as a family. Um, this for our family was graduation weekend. Uh, we first had a little tiny graduation from fifth grade for my daughter, um, which apparently is called a graduation now. I don't know. They played the graduation music and everything. Um, and then we had uh, my son Noah uh, finish high school. And so we had a little graduation and a big graduation. And he graduated from North Oconee um, High School. And it was interesting, you, you know, you've got 400 kids out on the football field for graduation, uh, this long season of waiting and training and formation had ended. Um, at North Oconee, who knows what color they are? They are red and gold. And they put these kids not in black graduation, but in bright red graduation gowns with these gold uh, stoles and these bright red graduation hats. Now, forgive me, I was doing some sermon planning while watching the graduation because I, I just saw all these kids with these bright red graduation caps. Um, and they've been trained and they've been formed and they're being unleashed on the world. And at the end, they all threw their hats in the air and went crazy. And I was like, it's, it's, it's not that different than Pentecost. There's this mighty sound, a rushing wind. There's red stuff over their head, and now they're being sent. They're being sent out. They're being unleashed. And in many ways, the apostles, this is almost like a graduation moment for them. They've spent all this time with the Lord Jesus. He's kept them close. He's trained them. He's guided them. He's been their friend. And now it's time for them to go out. Uh, the, the point of all that was for them to go out and the Holy Spirit comes upon them so that they could be unleashed on the world. That they've matured, that they can go be part of this mission, that they can use the gifts that they've acquired for the glory and goodness of the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he comes upon the church. When he comes upon you and me, he gets us ready uh, for what we're called to do. John Stott, who is a uh, another London pastor uh, once put it this way, that without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver. No understanding without the spirit of truth. No fellowship without the unity of the spirit. No Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit. And no effective witness 
without his power. He said, as a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the spirit is dead. We must be a church that welcomes the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's interesting. I, I was actually recently had coffee with uh, Pastor Nathaniel Hunsu. Uh, Pastor Nathaniel uh, is the head of the church that meets downstairs here. Um, the Apostolic Faith Church, it's a Pentecostal congregation. Um, they're out of the West Coast, Azusa Street Revival in the early 20th century, um, and they're not liturgical at all. Their services are very uh, spontaneous, um, wonderfully chaotic, where ours might be structured and contemplative. Um, but here's the thing. Um, first of all, we are joined by the Spirit and the Lord. And second, that wonderful Pentecostal church, uh, when they gather for worship, and our Anglican church, when we gather for worship, well, we both think the Holy Spirit's going to show up. And the Holy Spirit's going to do things. We actually trust the Holy Spirit every week to show up in, in supernatural ways and in ordinary ways, ways that he promised, drawing near to meet us in word and sacrament, inhabiting our prayers and our songs of praise, filling us each week anew with the peace of God that passes all understanding and the burning fire of mission as we are sent out to do the work that God has given us to do. Uh, many are surprised and delighted to know um, that Anglicans are really into the Holy Spirit now. I, I, I know, some of you guys didn't know this. Um, I mean, each week, I mean, think about it, even at the communion table, what do we pray? Lord, send down upon these gifts your Holy Spirit that they may be to us the body and blood of your son, Jesus. Like, we actually think a miracle happens every week at this table by the work of the Holy Spirit who comes upon um, not just these uh, gifts of bread and wine, but comes upon us as the body of Christ gathered. Um, many really are surprised to know that we think this is what happens. But I just want to submit something to you. I don't think we should be as surprised that a good structured Anglican service expects the Holy Spirit to be at work. And here's why. Um, I noticed this a few years ago. So Acts 2 begins with a boom, right? The Spirit comes upon them. It's wild. It's chaotic. You have this big sermon from Peter. And then what is the next thing the Holy Spirit does? Well, we're told, we're given a picture of the early church, of the Spirit fully at work in the church. And here's the portrait we're given. See if this sounds a little bit familiar. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The Holy Spirit that comes in the upper room takes root and is lived out and the teaching of the apostles, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Pretty ordinary, wonderful, everyday stuff. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, we ask the Holy Spirit to come, to fill us afresh and anew. And I want to invite you to actually stand this morning. We're going to pray together before we come to the creed. And we're going to pray what's been called one of the most dangerous prayers of the church, come Holy Spirit. Let's pray, come Holy Spirit. Draw men and women, young and old to yourself. Come Holy Spirit. Lead us into holiness and mission. Come, Holy Spirit, enliven our hearts that have grown cold and numb. Come, Holy Spirit, redeem, restore, renew. Come, Holy Spirit, heal, reconcile. Unite. Come, Holy Spirit. 
be present in our fellowship, friendships, families. Come, Holy Spirit, build and guide and bless your church. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Direct and rule our hearts in all things. Empower us for witness and ministry and daily increase in us your gifts and fruit to the glory of God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.